Is God to blame or is man to blame? Man is to blame for the evil and suffering in this world. The Bible. The Bible talks about predestination. The Bible talks about free will. So we ought to be interested in it. We ought to think carefully about it. I've been uh, talking a bit about Islam in some <clears throat> places where they've had me speaking. And uh, so I thought I would just uh, mention, uh, when we talk about predestination and free will, we will have to touch on Calvinism. I don't know whether we have any Calvinists here tonight. I don't know whether any of you even know what a Calvinist is. Uh, maybe I'll try to briefly explain that. But there are <clears throat> many similarities between Calvinism and Islam. And I thought I would give you a couple of quotes from the Quran. You know, the Quran, that's the scriptures of Islam. Uh, the Quran, Muhammad claimed that he received this by inspiration uh, from um, the angel Gabriel, who was in, sent by God, by Allah, not God. And, um, well, we won't have time to talk about that. But listen to what I'm quoting. Well, I'm, I'm quoting, first of all, from Surah 5, verse 48. Now, Surah is the chapter, there are 114 surahs in the Quran. <clears throat> Had Allah willed, he could have you one community. But that he might try you with which he hath given you, unto Allah you will all return, and he will inform you then of that wherein you differ. If we, interesting why <clears throat> Allah, who is a single individual, single entity, uses we, if we had so willed, we could have given every soul its guidance. But the word from me concerning evildoers took effect, and I will fill hell with the jinn and mankind together. <clears throat> you hear what, he said, what Allah is saying. We could have sent everybody to heaven, but instead we're filling hell. Um, Allah, this is, that, I'm sorry, that was uh, surah 3213. Surah 1693. Allah sendeth whom he will astray and guideth whom he will. If, he want, if Allah wants to send you astray, he sends you astray. Nothing you can do about it. If he wants to guide you, he will guide you. Uh, also, nothing you can do about it. In Calvinism, of course, uh, we're talking about predestination and free will. Uh, I believe in predestination. The Bible talks about predestination. But in Calvinism, God predestined certain ones to heaven and certain ones to hell. And there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you see, Paul um, persuaded men, the scripture says. Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. He tried to convince people that they should believe in Christ. Well, he didn't know about Calvinism. Uh, the elect don't need to be persuaded, and the non-elect can't be persuaded. There's no way you can change it. If God has predestined certain ones to hell, there's nothing you can do about it. There's no point in trying to persuade them. Uh, the scripture <clears throat> teaches us, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. No. <laughs> Satan could go on a vacation. Satan can't blind the elect that have been predestined to heaven. He doesn't need to blind the non-elect who have been predestined to hell. God has already done a better job of damning them than Satan could. So what part does Satan have to play in this? He could take a vacation. Uh, he might as well. Uh, the Bible is turned into a charade. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you have God pleading. He pleads with Israel, right? Over and over and over. Why, why is God pleading with people that he's already predestined to hell? Uh, what is the point of it? Why does he say, <laughs> choose you this day whom you will serve? If they can't choose, 
because the first, um, well, Calvinism, if you're not familiar, just very quickly, T-U-L-I-P, tulip. Beautiful flower, bad theology, in my opinion. <laughs> but anyway, T stands for total depravity. Now, you would say, well, I think man's totally depraved. Well, totally depraved? He can't do any good? Jesus said, even sinners know how to give good gifts to their children. Uh, uh, Abimelech, Philistine king, uh, could say to, uh, to Isaac, I have done you nothing but good. Uh, the scripture says, do good. <laughs> Calvinism says, no, man, by total depravity, they mean he, has the, he is unable to respond to the gospel. Unable to do what Isaiah 55 tells him to do. O oh, everyone that thirsteth, come to the waters. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. Okay? But why does Isaiah say that? Because there are wicked people. I mean, they're totally depraved. They can't possibly turn to the Lord. Um, well, anyway, I'm spending too much time. That's T. U. Unconditional election. So if man, each one uh, rests upon the previous one, if man cannot even make a step towards God, in spite of the fact that God makes a promise, <clears throat> and I can give this promise to anyone, anywhere, I don't care who they are, God said, you will search for me and find me. You will seek for me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Well, what's the point of saying that if they can't? They're totally depraved. They're totally unable to respond to God until they have been regenerated. Now, I had had many discussions with Calvinists, uh, and um, I <laughs> that is the most bizarre belief. And I didn't even understand that that was what they believed for many years, that you must be regenerated before you can get saved. <laughs> you have to be regenerated before God can give you the faith to believe the gospel. Amazing. And they would take that from uh, John 1, 13. You know what John 1, 13 says? Well, let's turn there for a minute quickly. John 1, 13 says, being born, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So you see there, if you're going to be born again, God has to do it. It has nothing to do with whether you believe, but God is going to born you again, <laughs> beget you again. Uh, so that's unconditional, the you unconditional election. Certain ones God elects for heaven has nothing to do with whether they believe or not. In fact, they can't believe, but he will regenerate them, and then he will give them the faith to believe. Isn't that what it says? They're born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now, when you study Calvinism as much as I have, you realize they're very selective uh, with their scriptures. I haven't found a Calvinist author who acknowledges, you see, you, you read the Calvinists, and I do the same thing in my books. Uh, um, my book, What Love Is This? Uh, we list in the back of the book the uh, scripture verses that we use and the page on which we use them. And you can look through Calvinist uh, books and you'll find John 1.13. Uh, they all go to John 1.13. But I haven't found a Calvinist who acknowledges that John 1.13 is preceded by verses 11 and 12. That's right. How about that? Yeah. And what do they say? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Yeah. So you become a child of God through receiving Christ and believing on his name. Of course, you can't born again yourself. But you must believe in Christ first. You must receive Christ, and then by the Spirit of God, you are born again 
into the family of God. But the Calvinist says, oh, no, no, no. You can't even have faith uh, to believe until you've been regenerated. And God sovereignly regenerates certain people, the ones that he decides to regenerate. Uh, how many of you knew that Calvinism taught that? Very, very few. Uh, so if we're saved by faith, uh, by believing, then you're not saved yet, but you've already been regenerated. But what does Peter say? <clears throat> Being born again, what? Uh, not of corruptible things, but of incorruptible. By what? The by the word of God Amen. that liveth and abideth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So to be born again, you must believe the gospel. Uh, but you're born again before you have faith because only after you're born again can God give you the faith. It, it doesn't fit the scriptures. But the Calvinist must do that because of his overemphasis upon sovereignty. Nothing can happen except God wills it. And we'll come to that in a moment. So, T, U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. You think Christ died for everybody? Uh, boy, how could you come to that conclusion? Well, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. I, you might find it interesting. I don't know if Philip has any of these, but we offer a tape. I had a, a little discussion with a couple of very bright Calvinist pastors. And uh, we came to John 3.16. I said, if what you're saying is true, you just pulled the rug out from under John 3.16. I mean, we've got all kinds of, of Sunday school children who sing. I don't know whether you sing it here, but in America we do. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. You sing that one? Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. But you can't say that. Because he doesn't love all the children of the world. Some of them he's predestined to go to hell. You couldn't possibly say he loved people that he predestined to go to hell. And I said, you know, I thought John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, they said, your problem is you don't understand the original Greek. The word world is Cosmos. And that doesn't mean every person in the world. It means all kinds of people. Uh, some rich, some poor, some black, some white, some fat, some skinny, you know. Uh, but it doesn't mean every person. It means all kinds of people. Well, I said, really? Um, I don't know the original Greek, which I don't. <clears throat> and that's essential in order for me to understand the Bible. Well, I said, then, if what you're saying is true, Wycliffe Bible translators are wasting their time. They've been going around the world studying these obscure languages of some tribe in order to try to put that language into writing and then to translate the Bible into that language so they will have the Bible in their own language. And when they finish doing that, the people still can't understand the Bible because they don't know Greek and Hebrew. I think they ought to teach everybody Greek and Hebrew and give everybody a Greek and Hebrew Bible. Uh, it amazes me that I, I don't want to offend anyone, and if you have this ambition, you want to go to seminary and study Greek and Hebrew, go ahead if you think that's what God wants you to do. I think you could spend your time better on other things. But um, you think that someone who's been to seminary and he studied Greek and Hebrew for four or five years, that suddenly he is able to improve upon the translation, let's say of the King James translators, who devoted their lives to these languages, who were experts in these languages. And you think with four or five years in seminary, you're going to now, oh, I think that ought to be, you know, okay, I don't think so. Uh, I think the Lord has given us his word in English. But anyway, I'm sorry, taking too much time. L, limited atonement, Christ didn't die for everybody. He only died for the elect. You wouldn't want some of Christ's blood to be wasted, would you? Uh, Spurgeon said, you think that Christ died for people who were already in hell before he came to this earth? 
Yes. But, but sin, some of Christ's blood is wasted. Look, you can't, <coughs> pardon me, you can't divide Christ's blood up and say this drop was shed for this person and this drop for that person. All of the blood of Christ had to be shed for one person to be saved, for Adam's sin to be atoned. You know, none of his blood is wasted. And uh, because people reject Christ, does not mean that he has failed. Uh, the Calvinist says, well, but if, there, if he died for people who reject him, then he failed. Didn't he come to save them? He's failed to do what he came to do. No, he hasn't failed because God loves us and, and people reject his love does not mean that his love has failed. Okay, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace, God's grace isn't something that he bestows and, and you are able to respond to it. His grace is irresistible. If he has, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a contradiction. It's an oxymoron. Grace is gracious. Grace is not irresistible. Um, but uh, because if God has elected you to heaven, if he's predestined you, chosen you to heaven, then he will see that you get there, whether you want to or not. <laughs> whether you believe or not, he will cause you to believe his grace is irresistible. Then P, uh, perseverance of the saints. Now I know there are probably some people here this, tonight, and you don't believe in eternal salvation. You don't believe that when Christ says, I give my sheep eternal life, you really have eternal life. You believe in an eternal life that you can have today and don't have it tomorrow. I don't think that's eternal life. Uh, but anyway, you believe in falling away, and one day when you get to heaven and walk the golden streets, you will be able to say, well, Lord, it was really wonderful about your grace and your mercy, but I kept myself saved. I lived a good enough life to keep saved. I get some credit in this too. I don't think so, but anyway, uh, I believe in eternal security, and therefore I thought that I was a one-point Calvinist, at least, the P. Perseverance of the saints. Ooh, I found out. This isn't perseverance of God. It's not, no one can pluck them out of my hand, but it's perseverance of the saints. It's up to you. Ooh, and that's the problem for a Calvinist, and I quote Calvinist. I quote R.C. Sproul. I don't know if you would know that name. He'd be very well known in America one of the leading Calvinists, I quote R.C. Sproul saying that he wasn't, how could he be sure he was saved? He wasn't living a good enough life. Well, I would say we never live a good enough life by God's standards. Uh, we may think we're doing pretty well by our standards. So the great problem for the Calvinist is salvation is not dependent upon whether you believe it or not. You can't. You have to be regenerated. Are, are you following me? Uh, and God sovereignly regenerates you, then he gives you the faith. <clears throat> well, how do you know that God sovereignly regenerated you? You had no, no part in this. Um, how do you know that the faith you now have is the faith he gave you? Uh, you, know, you understand, the Calvinist says, uh, faith is a gift. You, you can't uh, believe. God has to cause you to believe. Well, Peter, I think, knew about that. Jesus, remember, said to Peter, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Thy faith fail not. And Peter then, because he went through a situation, 1 Peter chapter 1, he talks about the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. According to your faith, be it unto you, Jesus said. Uh, you can go through the scriptures, the New Testament, and you can see, I don't know, 20 or 30 times it talks about your faith. Your faith. Because it is up to you to have faith. God expects you to believe his word. You have the responsibility to do that. What are rewards all about? <laughs> if God does everything, now, we can't draw breath without God. 
It's by his grace, it's by his mercy. But we have something to do as well. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not work for your salvation, but we're created in Christ Jesus unto good works with which God hath before ordained we should walk in them. We are therefore have the responsibility to work out in our lives the salvation that he has given us. For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and do. There's good pleasure. There's a partnership. Uh, Paul talks about, in Colossians 1, 29, uh, he talks about presenting every man perfect in Christ, he says. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then he says, whereunto I labor, striving according to his working that works in me mightily. Yes, I'm... You know, he has laid his hand upon me, he says in Philippians chapter 3. But I give everything I've got to be what he wants me to be. It is a partnership. I have a responsibility. Okay? Uh, so, perseverance of the saints. You have to live a good enough life. Or how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're one of the elect? Well, actually, John Calvin said there's a sure way to know you're one of the elect. If you were baptized as a baby even by a godless, fornicating Catholic priest, you are one of the elect. You find that in his institutes. And of course you know that this is why. Uh, my wife uh, comes from a Mennonite background. They were called Anabaptists. That meant when they got saved, they were baptized They'd been baptized as babies, but whether they had or hadn't, when you got saved, you were baptized. Baptism is for believers. The Ethiopian eunuch uh, says to uh, Philip, here is water. What would hinder me from being baptized? Philip says, if you believe. If you believe with all your heart, you can be baptized. A baby can't believe at all. They don't know what the gospel is. So that leads a lot of people astray. So John Calvin, <clears throat> in 1537, banned the Anabaptists from Geneva. The Catholics, the Lutherans, and the Calvinists burned them at the stake, drowned them, persecuted them, hounded them, because they were saying, infant baptism doesn't save. No, it doesn't. And this is true of Calvinists today, Presbyterian. Lutherans, I have friends who, when they got saved, they got baptized, were excommunicated from the Lutheran Church. Missouri Synod in America, which uh, we say that's the really evangelical one. Uh, and you will find this all through Europe, right, brother? You've got a state church. They're Lutherans or they're Catholics. Uh, and they get into this through baptism. Okay, so I thought I was at least a one-point Calvinist because I believe in eternal security. I found out I'm a zero-point Calvinist <laughs> because the Calvinist believes in eternal security for the wrong reasons. What do I believe? Christ made a promise, and I'm relying on his promise. He said, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. <coughs> <coughs> Pardon me. John 5, 24. Uh, Jesus said, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life. Now the moment you believe on Christ, you have everlasting life. Amen. Now I don't see how you could then tomorrow or next week or next year not have everlasting life. It wasn't everlasting. That was a false promise. You believe on me, you have everlasting life. And Jesus says you will not come into condemnation. You have passed from death unto life. So my, my hope, my confidence is in him. He made a promise. And I took him in his word. Now you have a, another type of a problem, and Philip has touched upon that a bit. You have those in Matthew 7. And uh, what is their reason for the Lord letting them into heaven. Ah, we've done miracles in your name. We've done signs and wonders. We cast out devils. 
Oh, that's their re No, 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 no. What they should have said was, Lord, you made a promise. You died for my sins. You said if I would believe in you, you would give me eternal life, and I believed in you. It's not by works of righteousness that we've done, but by his mercy he saved us. So I'm a zero-point Calvinist, folks. I guess that makes me not a Calvinist at all. Um, but um, our topic then this evening, predestination and free will. Now, you hear people say often, well, God's in control. <laughs> the Lord is still on his throne. <laughs> well, he is. But what does that mean? Was God on the throne? Was God in control when Satan rebelled? I think so, wasn't he? Satan didn't push God off his throne. Was God in control? Was he on his throne when Adam and Eve rebelled? I think so. Well, then what does it mean that God's on his throne and he's in control? Well, you go to Ephesians chapter 1. A favorite verse of the Calvinists. Well, of course, we get right into election, predestination. I believe election and predestination are the same. Verse 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, I'll just make this statement. Uh, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. I'll make this statement that predestination and election, they're one and the same in my opinion. They're uh, found very few times in the Bible and never unto salvation, but always unto blessing. Look at this. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. Now, that's a blessing that he didn't have to give us. You could be saved from hell. Uh, he didn't have to adopt you into his family. <laughs> Look, I'm saying the Bible teaches that. <laughs> but God didn't have to do that, you understand? He could have saved you without making you his children. Rescued you from hell. Put you off on some paradise somewhere. Who knows what? So he predestined us unto some blessings. Um, and go on down to verse 11. Well, let's take chap uh, verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven, which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, here's that word again, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to his will. Is that what it says? Not what it says. That's the way the Cal Calvinist says it. Worketh all things according to the counsel of his own will. Well, that changes it a bit, doesn't it? I mean, in the counsel of God's will, he has given man the power of choice. The counsel of his will has determined certain things, but it doesn't tell us that everything that happens on this earth is the will of God, does it? If everything that happened on this earth were the will of God, then God is to blame for sin, for rape, for murder. And why would Jesus have us pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, if everything is already God's will? It's not... God's will. God's will is continually resisted. Men defy God. You think that it's God's will that men do not keep the Ten Commandments? You think God gave the Ten Commandments just so that men would break them? You think this world of sin and evil, rebellion, <coughs> wars, rape, murder, crime, you think this is what God wants? You see, the, <clears throat> the atheist would say to you something like this. Look, wh wh where does all this evil and suffering, sickness and death come from? How could a good God create a world like that? Well, God didn't create the world like that. He created a perfect world. And Adam and Eve rebelled. They sinned. And that caused God's judgment to come upon them 
and upon their children. The atheist would say, look, if your God is too weak to stop all evil and suffering and death, he's too weak to be God. And if he could do it and doesn't, he's a monster. He's not worthy of your trust. But God gave man the power of choice. You cannot escape it. We couldn't love him if we didn't have the power to choose. We couldn't love one another. We couldn't receive salvation. We are accountable. Why would God plead with us unless we have the power to choose? I'll never forget, my wife and I were in, <clears throat> in Canada. I was speaking at a conference. We came into our hotel room late one evening, I turned on the television to see if we could find some news to see what had been happening that day. We wouldn't have seen this had we not been in Canada. It was an interview with a man, Canadian, on Canadian TV. He had been arrested in Saudi Arabia, falsely accused of being a terrorist, and tortured mercilessly. He said something I will never forget. He said, I learned two things. Number one, I don't care how strong you are, they can torture you and make you hurt so bad that they can make you confess to anything they want. They can make you confess you killed your mother. They can make you confess you killed God. But then he said, I learned something else. They cannot make you believe it. There is a place deep inside that they cannot touch. That's called the heart. That's what God wants. My son, give me thy heart. God has made man capable of choosing. Somebody says, well, why does some, one person believe in Jesus and another person doesn't? I mean, how do you figure that out? How, why? Well, I say, why don't you ask them? They're the ones that made the choice. Ask them. See, you're either going to blame it on God, and you're going to say that the reason a person rejects Christ and goes to hell is because God predestined him to do that. Or you're going to say the reason he rejects Christ is he decided in his heart not to receive Christ. Is God to blame or is man to blame? Man is to blame for the evil and suffering in this world. This is not the world that God made. Uh, go to um, Isaiah chapter 1. You really don't need to turn to these scriptures. I think you know them well enough. We could quote them. But for those who want to look at it, uh, verse 2. <clears throat> Hear, O heavens, give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. God is weeping. You hear his cry in the garden, Adam, where are you? It's not that God didn't know where Adam was and he's got to look around behind all the trees. God knows everything. He's saying, Adam, what happened? What did you do? Where have you put yourself now? Because he gave man the power of choice. We're not robots. We're not puppets. We are responsible moral beings. And we have something inside of us, the power of choice. And even God cannot make you believe what you don't want to believe. Well, that um, puts a pretty heavy responsibility on man, doesn't it? And that's why Paul persuaded men. And we are supposed to persuade. We're supposed to warn. God pleaded with Israel, did he not? Didn't Jesus weep over Jerusalem? How often would I have gathered you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. I would, but you would not. You can't say God predestined them not to believe. Well, then what are these, crocodile tears? Jesus is pretending to weep over people that he's already predestined 
to eternal damnation? That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. Now the Calvinist tries to get around that. Uh, well, let's, let's, we'll come back to that. Let's finish reading this. Verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, oh, foolish people. And he goes on. But go to chapter, uh, verse 18. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Let us reason together? <laughs> Why does God want to reason with us? He's already predestined certain ones to heaven and certain ones to hell. What is there to reason about? Nothing you can do about it. If you're elected, predestined to heaven, okay. If you're predestined to hell, nothing, you can't change it. What does he want to reason about? No, that can't be the way it is. It must be that man has a choice. He says, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then he says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Wow, it seems like man has a choice. You want to know why some people believe and some don't? Ask them. They made the choice. And God, I believe, has done everything he could to draw them to, uh, to himself. We are to love the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? With all your soul, your might, and your mind. That is a responsibility that God <clears throat> has, has put upon us. The scripture says, quote, the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves. Luke 7.30. A strange expression if God caused them to do that. Everything that happens in human affairs is not God's will. Listen to the lament of God in Jeremiah 44, 4 through 6. I sent unto you all my prophets, the servants, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. <coughs> Pardon me. But they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense unto other gods. Wherefore, my fury and mine anger was poured forth, and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. God refers to their idolatry as this abominable thing that I hate. Then how could you say that he predestined them to do this? How could you say that this was all God's will, that he caused them to do this abominable thing that he hates? I'm, I'm sorry, it doesn't make sense. Um, Jesus commends, quote, whosoever shall do the will of my father. That's my mother, my brother, my sister, and so <coughs> forth. Well, if there's a special commendation for those who do the will of the Father, then um, that doesn't make sense. If God causes them either to do it or not to do it. Um, you know Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. It shows very clearly that everyone doesn't always do the will of God. And you would find the same truth in Isaiah 65, 12, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 22, and so forth. There is a distinction between what God desires and wills and what he allows. Otherwise, we would have to blame all sin and all suffering on God. But the Calvinists cannot allow man to do anything independent of, of God. I'm quoting uh, A.W. Pink. Maybe some of you have read his book. You read Pink on the Sovereignty of God, anybody? Don't be ashamed to admit it. <laughs> That's one of the most popular books in uh, evangelical circles in America. Listen to what he says. 
to say that the sinner's salvation turns upon the action of his own will is another form of the God-dishonoring dogma of salvation by human efforts. Any movement of the will is a work. Well, that's simply not true. Now, faith is not a work. The scripture very clearly distinguishes the two. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. But the Calvinist says, for you to be able to believe in God, then you take credit for your salvation. You've done a work. You've worked. No, I haven't worked for my salvation by believing in God. They have uh, a wrong view of sovereignty. Uh, you can't do anything. You can't even sin, except God causes it. No, that's, that's not biblical. For me to believe, <laughs> that's not a work. And it's nothing that I could take credit for. Uh, if you're drowning and someone saves you and you allow them to save you, do you get credit for allowing them to save you? You'd be a fool not to allow them to do it. Uh, someone pulls you out of a burning building, you get credit for this because they rescued you? Doesn't make sense. But the Calvinists can't even allow you to believe. <coughs> well, that's a work. And God has to, you're, you're robbing God of his glory, so they would say. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You know that. Um, turn to 1 Timothy 2. See, the problem is we have a wrong view. The Calvinist has a wrong view of sovereignty. Now, we believe in foreknowledge. Uh, Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. We believe that God knows everything that will happen before it will happen. Well, but then if God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do, tomorrow, then Mr. Jones has to do what God knows he's going to do tomorrow, right? Otherwise, God would be wrong, and God can't be wrong. Then how could Jones have the free will? We're talking about predestination and free will. How could you have free will? All through the Bible, it talks about free will offerings. Man brings an offering, let him bring it willingly. He gives it from his heart. But the Calvinists can't allow that. No, God causes uh, him to do it. Uh, well, we are told to choose. We are held accountable to believe. That's something that I must do. But the Calvinist says, no, you can't do that until God sovereignly regenerates you. Uh, well, then how can Mr. Jones act on his own free will if he's got to do what God knows he's going to do? Because the fact that God knows what Mr. Jones is going to do does not cause Mr. Jones to do it. It simply indicates that God knows what will happen before it happens. Whoops, sorry. I'm trying to, trying to get rid of that because I want to take off my jacket. Um, well, how is that possible? Well, it is very possible, and thank you very much. Uh, not only is it possible, it's the way it must be. If I can just quickly find a, a quote from a scientist. Uh, scientist sa is saying, the actual, actual existence of past, present, and future is required by Einstein's theory of relativity, and I'm not relying on science. All space and time form a four-dimensional continuum that simply exists. The theory does not permit time to be treated as a dimension in which the future is open or incomplete. From a Christian point of view, it is reasonable to conclude that the temporal and the spatial extent of our universe were created together, and thus the entire four-dimensional structure resides 
before or in the view of its creator in an eternal present. Thus, our modern scientific understanding of the nature of time fits quite well with the Christian tradition that God has knowledge of all time, past, present, and future. Before Abraham was, I am. John Wesley, in about 1780, preached a sermon on this. <laughs> he said, God is not part of this universe, and time is part of the universe. God inhabits eternity, and what to us seems past, present, and future, God sees from outside, and he knows it all. But the fact that he knows what Mr. Jones will do does not cause Mr. Jones uh, to do it. Well, 1 Timothy 2.4, well, let's read from verse 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. It sounds like Christ died for all. Yes. It sounds like God wants all to be saved. Well, but the Calvinist says, now wait a minute, that doesn't mean all, <laughs> inclusively. It means all kinds, all classes. Uh, now, Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a Calvinist, but he got a little, got, got a little upset about what he called the old Calvinist view of this scripture. He said, I was reading today uh, the exegesis of uh, 1 Timothy 2, and the man makes it sound like God, instead of saying who would have all men to be saved, said who would not have all men to be saved. They say, oh, it means all classes of men. Spurgeon said, if God intended to say all classes of men, he would have said all classes of men. Uh, you see, it's, um, it's like this. It can get a little bit complicated. Um, it means uh, not, uh, it doesn't mean everyone uh, without exception, but it means everyone without distinction. Now that went right over your head. You didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so let me explain it. I'm a merchandiser. And I put an ad in the paper, all merchandise 50% off. You're excited. You come in there, you find something you want, you bring it up to the cash register. I'm sorry, that's full price. You say, but, but you had an ad, all merchandise 50% off. Well, yes, I meant all without distinction, but I didn't mean all without exception. I meant all kinds of merchandise, 50% off, but not every item. So the Calvinist says, you see, when God says all, what he means is all kinds of men. But he doesn't mean every person. Ah, come on. Now, not all Calvinists take that route. That's a route that John, uh, I'm sorry, that um, James White takes. We, I don't know, we have, do we have some of his books? Uh, debating Calvinism? Debating Calvinism, right. Uh, and that's what he says. Uh, let's take someone like John MacArthur. John MacArthur is a dear friend. Uh, good man. Uh, preaches the gospel. But John MacArthur says, no, you know what it means. Because you see, um, there are Calvinists and they um, accuse me. They say, oh, you're talking about hyper-Calvinism. We're not hyper-Calvinists. We're moderate Calvinists. I say, I'm sorry, folks, there is no distinction. Well, the distinction is the hy what you call hyper-Calvinists, they're simply honest. They admit that God doesn't love everybody. The, uh, the uh, moderate Calvinist, he says, oh, yes, God loves everybody. And you know how he proves that he loves everybody? He gives sunshine and rain and so forth. That's like giving a nice meal to someone just before you torture them and kill them. <laughs> what is... It's, oh, is it so loving of God to give sunshine and rain to people that he's already predestined to eternal torment in hell? That doesn't make sense. I'm sorry. Uh, 
And John MacArthur, he tries to explain it like this. Oh, God has two wills, a will of desire and a will of decree. You see, God really desires all men to be saved, but he doesn't decree for all men to be saved. Wait a minute. I thought you said God is sovereign. He can do anything he wants. Well, then how can you say he has a will of desire, but he doesn't, have, doesn't decree that those he desires to be saved? Can you imagine the eternal God, the infinite God, desires people to be saved, and he could cause them to be saved, but he doesn't. I don't think that makes sense. That's a cop-out. You are trying to escape from what the Bible says. You're trying to salvage the idea, oh, God loves everybody. But you've got him predestinating certain people to hell, and that is not love. And I've asked John, tell me, how is it love for God to predestine people? Well, to eternal torment. Well, the Calvinist says, you know, there are different kinds of love. Uh, you, you love your wife differently than you love your children or you love your neighbor or whatever. Love is love. And I don't care what kind of a love it is. It is not love at all to predestine someone to eternal torment that you could cause to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible, what the Bible teaches. Well, Calvinists or some of them object. Are you saying then that people can frustrate God's will? That Christ died for everybody? He really wants everybody in heaven, but people can just say no, and they can decide their eternal fate, and God can't do anything about it? Well, I, I wrote an article. If you don't get the Brian call, as Philip said, you're welcome to sign up for it. Be happy to send it to you free each month. I wrote an article titled, What a Sovereign God Cannot Do. Whoa, people got upset. God's all-powerful. God is sovereign. You dare to say there's something God can't do? Of course there is. He can't sin. He can't make a mistake. He can't contradict himself. He can't go back on his word. He can't even travel. Did you know that? Isn't he omnipresent? Of course there are things God can't do. Not because he's too weak to do them, but because he is infinite in righteousness, holiness. And there are three things in particular with regard to the salvation of man that God can't do. He can't forgive anybody unless the penalty's paid. That wouldn't be justice. That's the issue. That's a problem. A lot of people think, well, I've done more good than I have done evil. That's not going to work. You tell the judge, well, I know I was speeding the other day, but I've driven more times within the speed limit than I have exceeding it. Surely my good deeds will outweigh my bad. Well, you laugh because it won't work. It's ridiculous. But there are Catholics, Methodists, Baptists, all kinds of people. And this is the teaching of Islam. Your good deeds are weighed in the balance against your bad. If the good deeds outweigh the bad, then you make it. Uh, that won't work on any court of law. Uh, unless the penalty is paid, God cannot forgive your sins. And this is what Paul argues in Romans chapter 3. How can God be just and forgive sinners? Okay? <coughs> Pardon me. We got a little bug over in New Zealand. Sorry to bring a New Zealand bug over here, uh, folks. But... Um, and God can't make you love him because love comes from the heart. And he can't make anybody receive the gift of salvation. Now, one thing that you'll notice, uh, I've got a few more minutes here, folks. I'm watching my clock very carefully. The um, recorders told me 70 minutes. Uh, one thing you'll notice is the Calvinist avoids the Old Testament. Why does he avoid the Old Testament? Because you can't teach Calvinism from the Old Testament. The Passover, for example, was that for a certain elect within Israel? God had predestined certain ones 
to offer the Passover lamb and to escape from Egypt and others he predestined to be doomed and stay in Egypt? No. Who went through the Red Sea? All of them. You read it. Uh, well, we're very close. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and see what he says. Powerful scripture. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat. I wish I had time. I'd love to talk about this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The manna was a picture of Christ, and we are to eat Christ. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. Does that mean Jeremiah was tearing pages out of his Bible? Of course, he had a manuscript, but anyway, he was chewing the manuscript and swallowing it? Is that how you eat God's word? No, we're talking about something spiritual. And this is a spiritual uh, teaching here. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual <clears throat> rock that followed them. Imagine a rock following them, and that rock was Christ. And they all drank of this, and so forth. But they were overthrown in the wilderness. Most of them are in hell. How could that be? Because it was available to all. If you are willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, the punishment of God will come upon you. You can't talk about the Levitical sacrifices. You go to Romans chapter 9 and 10. It tells us that these the sacrificial system that God gave them, it was a picture of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, right? Was it for a certain elect within Israel? No. The Day of Atonement was for all. Now, I mentioned Calvinists are rather selective. John 3.16, limited atonement. Again, I haven't found a Calvinist writer who acknowledges that John 3.16 is preceded by verses 14 and 15. How about that? Jesus introduces verse 16 like this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ah, oh, the serpent was lifted up for all, and every one had the right to look and live. You can't say that salvation is just for a, a certain elect few. That's not biblical. That's not even rational. God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. Well, you say, but it says God did tempt Abram. No, the word there in the Hebrew is nasa. It meant to test the trial of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes. It's tried in the fire. Uh, Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without, no, no. He was tested. The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. There was nothing in Christ that was attracted to sin or evil. But he had the opportunity, but it did not draw him. There's a difference between being tempted and tested. Uh, and God cannot even be tempted with evil. You're not to tempt the Lord your God. You don't test him. You don't put him in a situation where he has to come through for you. That is what Jesus said. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. You don't test him. Well, I'll just walk across, I'll just close my eyes and walk across a busy highway in the midst of the the heaviest traffic, and I'm going to just trust God. God's going to have to rescue me. Well, you're probably going to get hit because you are putting God in a position where he has to do a miracle to save you, to rescue you, and he's given you some common sense. So that's called tempting of the Lord. They tested him. Free will does not conflict with God's sovereignty. He has given us the capacity to choose. And we are responsible 
to choose. Sovereignty, foreknowledge, and man's will. Turn to Romans chapter 8. It's a big subject, and we are not going to get very far, but I hope it will be helpful to you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. You know it well. For we know that all things work together for good. That's not where it stops. Well, all things work together for good. No, that's not what it says. All things work together for good to those who love God who are the called according to his purpose. For, and then it says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Predestination and election are always in conjunction with foreknowledge. First um, Peter chapter 1, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. Uh, what does that mean? I think there's only one explanation you can come to. Whom God knew, no, I'm sorry, who God knew would respond to Christ, he predestined them to the blessings that he had marked out for the redeemed. He foreknew those who would say yes and those who would say no. And it's like this. Let's say that you're a bunch of orphans here, and I'm a multi-billionaire, and I come into your orphanage and I say, I want all of you, I want to adopt all of you. And I just want to bless you. And uh, everybody says no, except this two, four, six, seven, these seven men right over here, okay? And uh, I take them to the mansion. There's a suite of rooms for each of them. Uh, just, uh, there's clothes in the closet, just fitting them. I mean, this is very, very materialistic. The cars that each of them like, you know, all of this nonsense. Uh, and then they look around and they say, where's the suites of rooms for the other people? I, I don't see any, any other cars or I don't see any. I say, well, I, I didn't prepare any suites of rooms for them. Well, why didn't you? You pleaded with them. You asked them. You said, you, yes, I really wanted to adopt them. But I knew that they would say no. So I didn't go to the bother of preparing anything for them. So we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God to certain blessings. <laughs> Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Predestined uh, to what? <clears throat> to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Very much like we had in Ephesians uh, chapter 1. He wouldn't have to bring us all into his his family. He wouldn't have to conform us all to the image of Christ. He could rescue us from hell. He could save us without doing all, all of that. So the Calvinist, how does he get around this? Well, for the, the word in the Greek, and I don't know anything about Greek or Hebrew or anything else, but we can look it up. You can look it up like I do. It's prognosco, a prognosis, a determination beforehand what was going to happen. To foreknow. God knew what men would do. Well, what's the Calvinist going to do? He says, oh no, it means foreloved. Whoops. I don't know what happened. Oh, here, we lost something. I don't know whether it's up or down, but anyway, there we are. Uh, the ones that he foreordained, those he predestined. That's nonsense. That's redundant. The ones he predestined, he predestined. No, the ones he knew, what they would choose. Those are the ones that he predestined according to what he knew. Turn to, uh, well, we're right here, Romans chapter 9. Just a couple of other passages here to show you what the Calvinist tries to do. Um, <clears throat> what about this, folks? Verse 13, as it is written... Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Go back and read the verses before. Uh, For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. 
as it is written, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. You see, God predestined Jacob to heaven and predestined Esau to hell. No. That's what the Calvinist says from this verse. That's not what the verse says. When the Bible says, as it is written, you better find out where it was written. Where was it written? Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. You find it only once in the scripture, once else. It's in Malachi chapter 1. And it's very clear, it's talking not about Jacob and Esau as individuals, much less about their personal salvation. It's talking about the nations descended from them and what God would use them, the purpose that he had for them. Uh, to verify that, go back to uh, Genesis 25 and verse 23. <clears throat> well, verse 22, the children struggled together within her. And she, that is Rebecca, Isaac's wife, uh, she said to the Lord, If it be so, why am I thus? She went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Well, there's two boys in there struggling around. I'm going to send one to heaven and the other to hell. Is that what it says? What does it say? Two nations are in thy womb. Two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. The one people shall be stronger than the other people and the elder shall serve the younger. If that's a prophecy about Jacob and Esau's individuals, it's a false prophecy, because Esau never served Jacob in their lifetime. It's about two nations, two manner of people. It's very clear from the beginning. And the Calvinist simply is not being honest with the Bible when he takes Jacob of I loved and Esau of I hated and tries to say, that means God predestined Jacob to heaven and Esau to hell. That's not what it says. Well, what about, <clears throat> wow, we're about to run out of my 70 minutes here. Uh, what about the potter? You go to the potter's house. He can do whatever he wants with the clay, can't he? Well, then can't God send people to hell if he wants and send some to heaven? <coughs> well, God can't send anyone to heaven who doesn't believe. He can't force you uh, against your will. But look, the potter, of course the potter has power over the clay. One lump to, for this and another lump for that. But we're not lumps of clay, folks. He's just saying God can do anything he wants to do as far as man is concerned. He has authority over us, but the Bible is filled. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. This is the way the Bible ends. If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you will be punished. What about Pharaoh? <clears throat> Didn't God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, but you'll find, you study it in the Old Testament, you'll find that twice before it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Right at the beginning, God said, I know he won't let your people go. Well, what does it mean that he hardened their heart? It's very much like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Those who refuse to receive the love of the truth will be given a strong delusion to believe the lie. The lie they want to believe. You don't want to believe the truth. You want to believe a lie. God says, I'll help you believe that lie that you want to believe. Pharaoh was a wicked, evil man. God knew his heart. And God caused him. Yes, he can do that. He caused Pharaoh to become, I mean, he caused this man who he knew inside and out to become the Pharaoh at the very time the children of Israel would be delivered from Egypt because he knew the stubbornness of this man and his evil. But it got to the point where <clears throat> Pharaoh was scared to death. The plagues are terrifying. He would have let them go, but no change in his heart for the wrong reasons. But God said, I'm not ready to let them go. I haven't yet executed my judgment on all the gods of Egypt. So he hardened, no, the word in the Hebrew is, he gave Pharaoh the guts. He strengthened his resolve to keep saying no because that's what Pharaoh wanted to do even when Pharaoh would have been frightened and, and would have let them go uh, otherwise. Well, we haven't uh, been able to cover our topic this evening. I think it's important. I think it's important whether God really wants everybody in heaven, whether God really loves everybody, uh, and whether it's God's, the, God is the one who causes people to go to hell, or whether we make that choice ourselves. Jesus said, Be ye therefore merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. 
Now, the Calvinist doesn't have to be merciful to everybody because the Father in heaven that he believes in is only merciful to the elect. But you have to be merciful to everyone because I think the God you believe in, the God that Jesus taught us about, the loving Father, is merciful to all. And he is not willing that any should perish. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Christ gave himself a ransom for all and this is what we stand upon. Father, thank you for your love. Yes, Lord, hallelujah. we are not worthy of anything, Lord. <clears throat> and you have redeemed us. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, thank you. you have won our hearts, Lord. We tell you tonight, Lord, we love you with all of our heart. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. <coughs> Lord, I ask your blessing and guidance upon every one of those here who disagree with what I've been saying. Uh, Lord, we've tried to be as gentle as we could. We ask that you will speak to all of our hearts. Yes, we only want your will and we want to know your word. We want to know you and your word. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.